Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining me today. Uh, I know how it feels to attend a session post-lunch, but still I'll try to keep the session interesting and engaging. Well, my name is Vasant. I'm a security consultant, have been in IT for the last nine years, and working in security ever since I started my career. So today we are going to talk about uh, securing Docker and Docker containers. We have close to 60 minutes, guys, so I'm not going to dive terribly deep into container and container security. But we are going to look at uh, vulnerability analysis and scanning of images, uh, exploiting containers, escaping the containers, and breaking out the containers and gaining access to the underlying host, and exploiting the Docker host due to some misconfigurations. And we are also going to look at some other components of uh, container security, like capabilities, namespaces, control groups, name, uh, app armor or SC Linux, and uh, other stuff. So this is uh, the agenda for us. We have close to 60 slides. And uh, in case if you happen to miss something, don't worry. Uh, I'll be sharing all uh, with you all this PDF. You can go home and recreate the same scenario. It has all the guidelines to install the tools and also the commands to test. So we are going to start with some uh, Docker basics. And we see Docker security scanning and exploiting the Dockers and inspecting and auditing some important components of Docker infrastructure and uh, hardening your Docker infrastructure. And if still the time permits, we are going to see monitoring of Docker infrastructure using uh, ELK stack. Well, containerization is not a, is not a new technology, guys. Uh, we have been using uh, components like control groups, namespaces, capabilities, or SC Linux for a very long time. These are the basic building blocks of containerization. In fact, Google has been using containers for a very long time now. However, Docker has been doing some really good stuff since 2013. Well, we all know the difference between uh, virtualization and containerization. However, uh, virtualization is uh, the technology of having guest operating system on top of host operating system. It was a revolution where developers were running multiple applications on different virtual machines, all hosted on a single host. <laughs> And uh, it has drastically reduced the hardware resources, and it was great for backups and operating system recovery. Uh, but however, there are some shortcomings as well. Like we have multiple guest operating systems on a single host operating system. It leads to some performance degradation. Also, it takes anywhere close to, close to a minute to spin up a virtual machine. Uh, also, there are some other issues like, uh, for example, a developer builds an application, and it works very much fine in his environment. But when it reaches production, there are certain issues with it, because due to the computing environment or differences in the environment between dev and the production. And uh, these days, we are breaking our large applications into smaller components called microservices. If we have a few microservices, we can afford few virtual machines. But what if we have hundreds of microservices? Along with the fact that scaling of uh, virtual machines being costly and tedious affair gave rise to containerization. So what is containerization? As you could see, there is no host operating, I mean, guest operating system on host operating system. All the libraries are binaries are directly run on uh, the host operating system, which makes processing much faster. And it may take anywhere just a uh, second to a fraction of seconds to a second to spin up a container. And containers are very light when compared to virtual machines. As I said, this is going to be a little fast track session, guys. So I'm going to start with some uh, Docker basics first. So we all know what is a Docker. Docker is a containerization platform which helps us to package all the applications and the required dependencies in the form of a container. It lets the developer to create a ready-to-run containerized application, and it makes deploying and managing of applications much easier. In short, in a nutshell, what a Docker can do for you is let you manage or deploy more applications on the same hardware than any other uh, softwares let us do. So this is uh, the infrastructure of the Docker. Today, we are, it starts with um, the client, which is going to be our command line interface today, which we are going to use. The Docker host, the email, and images, containers, and the registry. Today, we are going to use uh, Hub, which is a public registry, which hosts like hundreds of thousands of images. So let us start with uh, the live demo. I'm going to touch on uh, the few basics of Dockers in order to understand the rest of the session. So before we begin, we need an image 
uh, in order to spin up a container, we need an image. So when you spin up, when you run an image on a Docker container, it brings up a, I mean, on a search engine, it uh, brings up a container for us. So the command to search for any images, Docker search, I'm starting with hello world. Likewise, you can search for any image. It could be Docker search Ubuntu or Docker search Alpine, or it could be Docker search CentOS, anything. So once you have the image, the command to spin up a container is Docker run. Hello world. So if you observe, these are the four steps that takes place behind the command line interface on the daemon. Initially, our command line interface contacted the daemon, and then it pulled the hello world image from the Docker hub. And then it created a container and then streamed that output back to the client, which we are reading now. If you want to spin up a container and if you want to interact with it, we use the command docker run and the flag if an ID. I'm going to give a name to my container, demo x, and I want the container to spin up on Alpine image and I want the shell of the container. Wow, we are inside the container and if you observe, it took just a fraction of seconds for us to spin up a container. Now I'm inside a container. Docker PS will help us to identify the images or the containers that are running inside our infrastructure. So I have spin up uh, an image called demo X like 16 seconds ago. If you want to execute commands remotely on a running container, we use the command called docker exec. The name of the image, demo X, IPADDR, or ID, this is how you can execute commands on a container running which is remotely. Now if you want to spin up a container and if you want to mount something to a container, we use the command, we use the flag hyphen V. So these are the current contents in my present working directory. And I'm going to spin up a new container, demo Y. And this time I'm mounting my volume of present working directory to the temp folder of my container. Now if I get inside the temp folder of my container, you should see all the stuff which I have in my present working directory. This is how you can mount volumes. Cool, we have seen how to search for images, how to pull images. What if you want to build your own image? Use the command called docker build. And docker build builds your image based on a template or the docker file which you define. So you define uh, all your requirements in a template in the Docker file. I say my image has to be built on Alpine image and these are the softwares needs to be added while I build an image and I also want to expose some port. There are numerous flags which you can even add. So I'm going to build a fresh image, Docker build hyphen T. I'm going to give a name called uh, workshop and I'm going to give a tag to it and it my current location. It is going to build a fresh image for us. Wow, it is built. Now if I look at my images, I have the newly built image, which, is, which has been like five seconds ago. Cool. So far we have seen like single, single images or single containers. Let us assume we have uh, multiple applications running on multiple containers and all containers are linked to each other. And if you don't want to issue single commands every time you want to bring up your containers or applications, and if you want to bring up your whole stack with just a single command, we use the tool called Docker Compose. <coughs> now let us see how we can bring up a stack within a fraction of seconds using this Docker Compose. For that, we need to define a compose file. So in this example, I'm going to bring up two services, which is my backend database and my frontend WordPress. So I just use the command docker compose. Just up with just one single command, it should bring up your infrastructure. Oh, it says it has been completed. Now if I look at the containers which are running, a WordPress has been done and it is running on port 8000. If I access port 8000, I should have my WordPress site up and running. Wow. In just a fraction of seconds or seconds, you can bring up your stacks using Docker Compose. Cool. 
there could be some people who are not interested in issuing commands and if they want to gain visibility into their infrastructure for such scenarios i came across one simple interesting tool called dry you can install this tool with just two simple commands and when you invoke dry it would give uh, visibility of your complete infrastructure it could be your images or it could be your containers or it could be your networks it could be your volumes everything and if you want to deep dive just go to choose something and press enter it would give more information about that so this is one uh, useful command line interface which i found to be useful guys sounds good now if the same thing if you could do using a graphical user interface or a web interface we have something called portainer it is an open source and you can spin up a portainer container with just two commands again you have those commands in the pdf which i am going to share and portainer runs on port 9000 and i'm logging in with my credentials which i have created wow so you can access everything or you can gain visibility into your docker infrastructure using this portainer this is an open source and it could be like your images or it could be your containers or anything if you want to perform certain actions like start stop kill restart you can do everything using this portainer cool guys now let us start with uh, the security section of today's workshop let us start with uh, vulnerability scanning of images so why do you think uh, scanning is an important uh, part for any organization a big part of any organization risk assessment process is to gain visibility into the vulnerabilities in the softwares that are being used uh, we all know that developers are uh, delivery oriented they can spin up any image imaginable within like matter of seconds but can they be sure that they are free of vulnerabilities definitely no and today we are going to look at a couple of free open source scanners which helps us to perform uh, security scanning or analysis or uh, uh, on the images so for this i have chosen two open source tools the first one being uh, anchor so i'm going to scan one vulner deliberately vulnerable image which will give us so this is uh, how you show the command anchor query and the image that we want want to scan and i'm um, i'm saying that hey scan for all cve vulnerabilities it may take uh, anywhere close to a minute guys and you can in fact use the same tools or the same scanners in your ci cd pipelines when a developer uh, pushes a code and if your build automation tool builds a docker uh, build on, uh, on the docker file and once the build takes place you can invoke the scanner and scan for uh, the images and depending on the vulnerabilities you can either pass or fail the build and you can push them to your repository if you look at the output we have got these many vulnerabilities in this image and this scanner gives us information like cve id and the severity of the vulnerability could be medium high or low and the vulnerable package that is affected and the url for more information about that vulnerability now i'm going to uh, show you some another tool called clear so this time let us scan uh, for a official fresh image which is mysql go oh, it's quick this time and uh, the output is quite colorful well this tool if you observe it again works more or less the same way it gives the name of the vulnerability and the description of the vulnerability and the severity of the vulnerability and what not so this is how we can use open source uh, tools to identify the vulnerabilities or to scan your images and these tools are free of cost guys so let us start with our next section exploitation of containers uh, yep the right to go the right to uh Uh, I'm sorry. Could you please come again? Those two scanners. Yep. Are they just scanning packages that are from the Linux distribution? Yep. Whatever images you download on your Docker host, you can scan any image. It, they basically have a CV database behind. They go through all the libraries installed in your um, or the components installed on your image and check them against with the CV database. So let us start with uh, the exploitation section, guys, which is going to be a fun section. uh we are going to look at a couple of scenarios in the first scenario we are going to exploit a container which is running a vulnerable uh, uh web services and after gaining access to that container we are going to see how to escape out of the container and gain access to the underlying host
So this is going to be my attacker's mission today. And I have taken a vulnerable image or a vulnerable web service and attacker, I mean, attacker or a penetration tester identified that there is a code execution in this vulnerability, I mean, in this application. And when you issue commands, it directly interacts with the underlying host. Now, in order to gain access to this container, attacker will spin up or will start an netcat listener on his attacking machine. This is my attacking machine. And I'm going to use a Python reverse shell in order to gain access to this container. I'm using a Python reverse shell. Uh, the IP address of my attacking machine is 172.170.3, and I'm listening on port 4444. Just observe uh, the black screen, guys. Hopefully, we should receive a shell if everything works fine. Well, wow. it says we have received a shell from 172.170.4, which is a vulnerable container. Now, after gaining access, the attacker or a penetration tester will not just stop there. They further enumerate and try to gain much more access inside our environment. During his enumeration, attacker has identified that there is something called docker.soc, which is insecurely mounted to this container. This socket, it is a socket which is used by Docker daemon to listen. And we can interact with the Docker daemon from a, within a container using this Docker socket. So now what an attacker does is, he simply installs Docker on this container. This concept is also called Docker on top of Docker. We have a Docker host, and a vulnerable container is running on top of it. And now the attacker has again installed Docker on the vulnerable container. Docker yep. <laughs> so now because uh, he has installed Docker on the container, he can start interacting with the underlying host, which means now he has access to the underlying host, to the complete Docker infrastructure. This is how an attackers can bypass and gain access to the underlying host. So, sorry, I didn't understand this part. Yep. So initially, we are inside the container. We got access to this container. Now, the attacker identified something called. Docker. Yep. So this is a socket which is basically used by the Docker daemon. So if you want to interact with your Docker daemon from within a container, it is Docker. Docker. So now what an attacker did is he installed Docker on this container. Yeah. And because this Docker socket has been mounted to this, he can start interacting with the underlying host. So I think the media guy is still not. It's not to mount exactly. So guys, as I said, uh, this is going to be a fast track session. If you have any questions, we will discuss them post session. So this is uh, the first scenario. Uh, we have a second scenario where uh, an attacker or a penetration tester is performing a port scan inside the network, and he comes across one of the machine where TCP port is open and Docker service is running on top of it. Now we will see how attacker abuses that functionality and creates a backdoor and gain access to the remote machine. So for this, the left-hand side is going to be my attacker's machine, and uh, on the right-hand side is going to be my victim's machine. All right, so this is the IP address of the victim's machine, and I'm going to perform a port scan. <coughs> wow, this is surprising. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, if you observe, it says, I have a Docker service up and running on port 2375. Now, in order to interact with the remote host, the command format seems to be very much same, but we use a different flag called the 
Now, instead of interacting with the local host, when we define hyphen H and if we give the remote IP address, it will start interacting with the remote host. Now, to just to make sure, if I issue the command on the remote victim's machine, it seems to be very much same. But the address up here, we will see what, how we can take it ahead from here. Now, being an attacker or a penetration tester, I'll spin up a server or a container on the victim's machine. On host, this is the IP address of the victim, and I'm spinning up a container. And if you observe, I'm mounting the root volume into the mount folder of this container. So what I'm going to do is, I'm sure there could be many penetration testers here. What I'm going to do is, I'm updating the ETC password file with a backdoor, which creates a username called tour and some password with password. So before making the changes, if I observe the contents of this on the victim's machine, we don't have any user called tour, if you observe properly. But now, after issuing this command on the attacker's machine, we should have a user called tour. Now what I'll do is, I'll simply quit from this container and I'll SSH into the victim's machine with the username and the password of the backdoor that I have just created. Oh, we are inside the victim's machine. So for this to work, should the victim's machine have SSH anymore? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I have deliberately created some vulnerable environments. <laughs> uh, it's not just you need to use the same format. In fact, you can copy your uh, public keys into the authorized keys folder of the victim's machine, and there are a number of ways. These are just some techniques which I want to show you all today. So this is uh, the second scenario, guys. And uh, we are going to look at a third scenario. In this third scenario, we assume that the attacker has already gained access to a container. It could be like due to some vulnerable web application, or it could be via SSH or anything. So right side is going to be my victim's machine, and on the left hand side is going to be my attacker's machine again. So this is the right hand side where I have already gained access to a container. During enumeration, <coughs> I'm performing some operations and I try to find the capabilities of the container and this container is running with root privileges. And I also I try to identify the processes running inside this container. Well, there are like numerous processes which is quite abnormal. A basic container will never have these many processes running. From this being an attacker or a penetration tester, we can deduce that this container can see the processes running on the host. So going a step forward, what I'll do is, I'll try to identify the processes running with root privileges. I have a couple of processes running with root privileges. And now I try to perform some injection into this process ID, which should give uh, access to my victim's machine. So for that, what I'll do is, I'll create a payload saying that, hey, I want a shell code, which should give a reverse shell to me, and with the attacker's IP address and the attacker's port. I have already created a shell code for that, guys. So this is my shell code. I'm going to transfer this payload into my victim's machine. For that, I'm going to bring up a simple HTTP server. On port 8002. Cool. <coughs> now on the victim's machine, I am going to download uh, this payload. It has been downloaded successfully. I'm going to extract this payload. So these are the contents. This is the payload which I created when which is executed into the shell of the victim's machine should give reverse shell to the attacker. And this is the injector which I'm going to use. Just wanted to make sure that we are injecting into the right process. And for that, on the attacker's machine, 
I'm going to spin up a netcat listener on port 444 slash injector 7. I'm injecting my payload. Fingers crossed. Hope if everything goes well, we should receive a shell on the left side. You, you didn't press enter on the left side. Oops. I'm sorry. Cool. So it is 705 this time. It's again injecting. Well, we received a shell on the attacker's machine. Now, if you observe one thing, we have uh, performed an uh, injection on the container, but we have gained access to the underlying host. If you observe this IP address, we have gained access to the underlying host, but not just the container. So this is how you can gain access or break out of the container and gain access to the underlying host. Guys, this is our third scenario. There are like quite a few scenarios which I wanted to show you all, but as I said, we have a little time constraint. Now let us look at uh, some technique. Docker uses a technology called namespaces, which will, uh, I mean, what are these namespaces? It is a technology used by Docker to create separate namespaces or which provides isolation or which provides an isolated workspace called container. When you spin up a container, Docker engine creates a group of or set of namespaces for containers. You will have everything in this PDF, guys. If you want to recreate any attack or any scanners, you can use this PDF. So Docker basically uses uh, namespaces like uh, PID namespace, net namespace, IPC, mount, UTS, and user namespace. So now let us see how user namespace works. So I'm a root user now on this machine. I have some file called secrets.txt. And there are some contents inside this file. Now, if I switch to a normal user, I won't be able to access these files because this is uh, only root user has privileges and only he can access these files. Now, being the same user, I'm going to spin up a container, but I'm mounting the volume of slash root into the temp folder of this. Now, if I get inside the temp folder of this one, we have something called secrets.txt and an attacker or anyone inside can access the secret files. On Monday, you can go to your organization and you can try this and I'm sure you'll get some good results. <laughs> so how do we stop this? Because if you observe, every time you spin up a container, we have a root user inside the container. So this time we are going to use a user namespace It's the same thing if I get inside the temp folder, it says permission denied because this time you are not a root inside the container. This is how you can restrict to users inside a container using namespaces. Can, can the user still just do a, a CU and become root? Uh, no. no. Uh, there is a concept we are going to discuss. At times you want the user to be root, but still you don't want that root user to perform everything. Guys, every time for an attacker, it's not just about uh, gaining access to your environment or uh, popping up shells or uh, doing such type of things. It could be also creating or depleting the resources inside your infrastructure by creating some DOS attacks. So now let us look at a scenario. If you look at the CPU utilization of this machine, it's close to 1.3% or 0.7%.
I have something called uh, malicious. Im uh, I'm going to spin up a container now. I have spinned up just one container, and now if you look at the CPU utilization of my machine, it's 100%, it has completely maxed. So probably an attacker can completely deplete your resources just by spinning up one container inside your infrastructure. So that is where we use something called uh, control groups. What control groups does is it limits or it allows the Docker engine to restrict the resources that a container can use. So there are some control groups like uh, CPU shares or uh, memory reservation, uh, device read IOPS, and uh, if you want to know how to restrict them, I have uh, given the examples on the commands, you can try them. Now let us look into uh, ne our next section, uh, inspecting or auditing of Docker infrastructure. So we are going to look at uh, inspection of different components like Docker host, Docker image, Docker container, and other stuff. So why should we uh, inspect our Docker images? In the recent times, in the very same year, Docker has removed close to 17 backdoor images from Docker Hub, which are being used in n number of infrastructures and uh, hundreds of thousands of such containers have been downloaded. How they work is, once if somebody spins up a container based on that image, it could simply listen to an open port in your infrastructure, or it could give a shell to the attacker, or in fact, they could be used for crypto mining or some other stuff. Let us, uh, let me show this to you by an example. Uh, let me quickly remove this image, otherwise it would create a DOS in my machine. All right, so left hand side is going to be my attacker's machine. <laughs> Cool. Now let us assume that attacker has put some vulnerable image in our infrastructure. So being an attacker, I'll just listen on one of the ports. And on the victim infrastructure, I'm not going to do anything but just spin up for normal container. If you observe it, I didn't do anything, I just spin up a container and the attacker has got the shell from our infrastructure. So based on these vulnerable images, if you ever spin up containers or if you happen to use such vulnerable images in your stacks, there is a possibility that it could give access to the attacker very easily. Now let us see how we can inspect our containers and why should we inspect. So normally developers has this habit of using API keys or it could be using our uh, hard-coded uh, credentials or something while writing the code. So I have a container called WordPress and let us inspect this one. The command is docker inspect. The name of the container will give a bunch of information. So I'm going to If you observe this one, one can easily gather information like uh, DB user, or it could be DB password, or something else. That is why we should always ensure that we should inspect our containers as well, along with images. So the volume that I have in my infrastructure, now how do I inspect my volumes, and why should I inspect? The command is docker inspect. For example, let us say I want to inspect this particular thing. It gives us the information about this particular volume and where it is mounted and other stuff. 
And for likewise, if you happen to inspect all the volumes and get into those particular folders, there is a possibility again that you could see some hard-coded secrets or credentials or anything inside those mount points. And how do we inspect our networks? It's the same command, docker inspect name of the network will give us some information about or visibility about that particular network. There is a possibility that attacker after gaining access to your infrastructure could create some new network with different services or using bridge or overlay some other uh, different connections. So that is why we should also monitor or uh, investigate our networks. The command docker info will give the information about your docker infrastructure. It says uh, all the information about your Docker infrastructure. And one important thing is, guys, we should also inspect our Docker service, which is quite important for us. Why should we inspect? If you observe here, we have a Docker service running on port 2375 because of which we were able to attack this host by creating a backdoor, which is why we should always inspect and ensure that there are no TCP ports open or we are not uh, allowing our Docker API to listen on TCP ports or any open ports. And in one of the scenarios, we have attacked a container and uh, then we installed Docker on top of the Docker because of insecure mounts. If you identify such insecure mounts, I'm going to inspect uh, this one. It says the docker.socket, the source has been mounted onto docker.socket. This is how you can identify which container has some insecure mounts. Uh, no need to click the pics guys. I'll be giving you the PDF. You have everything in that PDF. Now, uh, we have seen auditing and inspection of different components of Docker. Now, let us see how we can secure our Docker infrastructure. <laughs> well, uh, when it comes to securing our Docker infrastructure, we have like a uh, few components that we need to consider. One is capabilities. And the next one is uh, SecComp. I'm sure this name is familiar for most of you all. And uh, the other one is uh, SC Linux. So let us take an example how these works as different layers of defense for us. I'm going to start with capabilities. So here somebody was asking me, at times we may need uh, the container or the user being having root privileges inside a container, but we don't want that root to perform everything. That is why we use capabilities. These capabilities are basically used to break apart the privileges that a root user has. I'm going to spin up a simple container and I'm saying change ownership to nobody of the root volume. And if you observe, it has executed successfully. Now I'm spinning up another container. This time, I'm removing the capability called change ownership and we see how it works. It says operation not permitted. If you observe, he is still a root user, but still now because we have uh, dropped the capability of change ownership, he won't be perform this operation. This is how you can remove the capabilities. Now let us look into some other example. This time we are spinning up another container and I'm dropping the net admin capabilities, which means the root user won't be perform any uh, network commands. We are inside a container, and if you observe, he's a root. 
but still he won't be able to perform certain actions this is how you can either add capabilities or remove capabilities inside a container and if you want to observe what all capabilities a container had got we use a tool called cap sh so these are the capabilities so you can choose which one to add and which one to remove depending on your requirements one uh, the next one is app armor this is a linux security module as it says it protects the operating system by applying profiles to individual applications or containers now let us see in action how does it works as additional layer of defense now i'm go i'm spinning up a container and i'm giving this container sysadmin privileges i have removed one layer of defense called the secomp it's unconfined and i have also removed additional layer of defense called app armor which means this container has got all the privileges and i'm going to create two directories and bind them the command executed successfully now we will see how app armor works as an additional layer of defense i'm going to create uh, recreate the same scenario but this time i'm letting the app armor to work as one layer of defense i'm still giving this container full sysadmin capabilities and i have removed additional layer of defense which means ideally only app armor is working in this scenario now if i try to perform the same action here it says permission failed just because we have app armor running and working behind and we have two other things called uh, secomp and sc linux i'm leaving it to you guys to work i have given the commands and everything how to use them now we are going to look at our last concept which is docker content trust so what is docker content trust it is a feature in the docker containerization platform that enables remote registry content to be digitally signed by enabling docker content trust it will let us to download only official or signed images so how we enable this this is how we enable docker content trust in our docker infrastructure now let us try to pull a couple of images i'm trying to pull some vulnerable image oh and it says remote trust data does not exist for this particular image now if i try to download an official image for example let us i am trying to download alpine we could download the official image now let us disable docker content trust and i see this now i am going to disable this and i am going to download the same vulnerable image which was not downloaded earlier this time we were able to download successfully so by enabling docker content trust it won't let your developers or devops guys to download any unofficial or unsigned images and uh, if you observe one thing while the docker content trust is enabled or disabled you are able to download official images so but why could you download official images official images undergo a rigorous open source review process to ensure that they follow the best practices like uh, signing or being lean and having clearly written docker files these are the reasons why it is strongly recommended that you use official images whenever possible guys securing your uh, dockers in the ci cd pipeline we all know that uh, we have moved from uh, waterfall model to agile and then from agile to devops and uh, the basic notion of devops is like fail fast and fail often 
right? But if you observe this one, people think that fail fast sounds rather negative, but you could describe as learn fast. I wanted to show you all uh, to create a pipeline and show it, but this is not the right time, guys. So what happens is, as we discussed, we have a developer who pushes a code to your Jenkins, or and once if uh, the build automation takes place, it will create an image. Once your Docker image is built, you can invoke a scanner on that image, like open source scanners, which we have seen. Once if the image, if the build passes, you can push it to your repository and you can build the rest of your stacks on your golden images. Otherwise, you can simply fail the build. So our last section is uh, monitoring our infrastructure. Guys, monitoring is like uh, an important plays a very vital role in any infrastructure. It could be like your virtualization infrastructure, or it could be your cloud infrastructure, or it could be your Docker infrastructure, or anything. It could be from the compliance perspective, or it could be from the incident handling or analysis perspective, or it could be from forensics perspective. Monitoring plays a very vital role. But when it comes to Docker's, Docker's being very lightweight and one could spin up containers within like matter of seconds, it becomes very difficult and tedious task to monitor the Docker's. In any organizations, Docker's, uh, I mean containers spin up like mushrooms after a rain. So in this scenario, I wanted to show you all an ELK stack. What is ELK? I'm sure many people must have already worked on ELK. So it is a combination of Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana. Elasticsearch is a NoSQL database and Logstash basically takes input, I mean uh, logs from various sources and then pushes it and Kibana is our graphical user interface where we can see the logs. So we have different logs and at this time I'm going to use something called FileBeat which will pick up the logs from all the containers inside your infrastructure and push them to Logstash and then from there to Elasticsearch which you can visualize in Kibana. I've created a small demo, guys. Uh, we should have received some logs by now because of we have uh, spinned up so many containers. Yeah, uh, this is instant handling and monitoring all together a different world and it's a different animal. It is like uh, bringing or pushing up the logs into your uh, monitoring tool and creating the dashboards or creating reports or writing alerts. It takes a huge time, even if you want me to explain it, it takes anywhere close to 30 minutes now. I don't think it is the right time for us to show this. But I'm going to share this information. I'm available on LinkedIn. You can just ping me. I'll tell you how to spin up this thing in your infrastructures. And ELK is an open source. Now let us quickly move to our last section. For example, if you observe, we have uh, the names of the containers which we have used. And uh, the container IDs and the logs from those containers So this is how you can use ELK stack to monitor or gain visibility into your Docker infrastructure. So this is the last section for today, guys. So these are some Docker best security practices, which I feel there could be numerous more, but at least ensuring that if you could follow these security best practices, we can ensure that our infrastructure is quite safe. The first one is ensure your host security, which I don't need to tell you all, like uh, patch your Docker host and use AppArmor or SC Linux and update your Docker software regularly and ensure that your Docker engine is not exposed on TCP ports. And check your image provenance. We have seen how to use Docker Content Trust, which enables us to download only signed images. The next one is monitoring your containers. And also ensure that do not run container processes as root. A root inside a container is always a root on the host until unless you remove the capabilities. And also make sure you do not uh, store the secrets. We have uh, seen a scenario where we were inspecting a Docker container and we came across a username and a password. And uh, ensure that base image security like specify the package versions which need to be installed and scan your images regularly for vulnerabilities and update base images and build your stacks on top of them. And uh, just something which we have seen, limiting the container resources using control groups and uh, runtime security. So if uh, 
you all want this PDF, please click a pick of this one. You can download this PDF from this one. And also, if anybody wants, the whole scenario we have seen today is because of two vulnerable machines. If you want to have these two vulnerable machines, uh, you can just ping me. I'll share those uh, vulnerable machines with you all, and you can recreate the same scenarios in your infrastructure. You can go home and, again, practice them. Cool, guys. So I would like to end the session with a small note. Uh, in the few years, we have seen that it could be the containerization industry or the user awareness or the technology has skyrocketed in the last few years. I could uh, confidently say like containerization is one of the fastest growing technologies now. Uh, this technology has seen adoption in key enterprises like Microsoft and Google. And you know what? According to a Docker, more than three and a half million containerized applications have been placed using Docker software. And more than 37 billion containerized applications have been downloaded so far. And trust me, guys, and this container application market is going to explode in the next coming few years. And uh, I have personally ran into many businesses who already moved their server applications from uh, virtual machines to containers. And uh, there are like inherent security benefits of containerization when used appropriately and secu like securely, like it could be transparency, it could be modularity, or it could be reduced attack services, or it could be environment parity or easy updates. So it's worth noting how uh, containerization provides us the security benefits that other infrastructure platforms do not provide. So that's all uh, from my end today, guys. Thank you all for attending the session. And it's always an honor to share with the community what I have learned. Excuse me. Um, I wanted to know, like, how we...